Hello and welcome to the Raptors Weekly Podcast. I'm Earl Sampson Folk, and today to discuss the laborious, long, somewhat heartbreaking offseason that the Raptors had and how they've come out of it looking, I guess that's to be determined by what we say on the podcast, but to talk about it, Oren Weisfeld of The Guardian, CBC, Step Back, Raptors Republic, he's pretty much written everywhere that you've read. He's a big deal. And so he's here to talk basketball with me. Oren, how you doing, man? Yeah, thank you for having me again. Uh, I am doing pretty well, all things considered. Especially, you know, we're actually having a good day in Toronto. It's 10 degrees outside. I shot some hoops yesterday, which was encouraging. Uh, but it's all going downhill from here, and I recognize that. What's the What's the most impressive part of your game when you go to shoot hoops? What is the If you had to get a bucket, yeah. what are you trying to do? I'll give you my scouting report. Um, okay. I actually only started really playing basketball about a year ago. I'm pretty short, so I grew up just, I was a soccer player. Um, But yeah, I've been serious about it for the last year. Um, I can't shoot, but I have a good, I have a good burst. I'll I'll beat you, you know, to the basket. And then there it's, it's really anybody's guess if, if I'm going to make the layup or not, but I'm I'm improving a lot. I have a bit of a emerging floater game in me. Got to get it over those big men. Um, but yeah, can't shoot. Got to shoot. And then and then it'll open a lot of things up. Yeah, the jump shot, increasingly an important thing to have in your bag. Even just as a guy who walks the street and does something else. An accountant has to have a jump shot nowadays. Otherwise, you know, maybe there's a game. Everybody yeah. gets together. You and they just know. they sink to below the free throw line on you. And they say, shoot it. And all you can do is feel really embarrassed and really emasculated. But anyway, that's not you. That's a hypothetical guy. Nothing bad happened here. It can be but, me, but but every <laughs> once in a while, I'll I'll make them pay. I'll have a good shooting day, but it it definitely can be me. Okay. okay. Well, you know, upward and onward, uh, working on the jump shot, yeah. as is Chris Boucher, hopefully, who will fight. You know, he features into the team quite a bit more this year, or at least will have to. Judged by what the Raptors have done to construct their roster and and how they've done it. But to get to that point, Serge Ibaka, Marcus All, they exit the team. And it wasn't like the Raptors were like, hey, go ahead, you know, enjoy the sunset of your career. They tried to keep both of them. And at least that's the way it was reported by Adrian Wojnarowski, Sham Sharanya. What did you think about that odyssey of going from, okay, we're going to keep Serge, we've got Serge. Serge is gone. Okay, find Mark. Where the hell is Mark? We're keeping him now. Mark's gone. Okay, Baines, Len, Boucher. All really quick. What do you think of that? Yeah, it played out pretty funny um, because you kind of convince yourself, like, as things start going ro- worse and worse, you kind of convince yourself more and more, like, oh, uh, if we just get this player, we'll be fine. Even though a week ago, if we just got that player, you would have been really disappointed. Like, that's definitely what happened with me and Mark once Serge was gone. I was like, well, at least we got to get Mark because, you know, he'll fix a lot of things, you know. Um, but honestly, the way the season ended, I was like, yeah, I don't really need to bring Mark back. I just, I'm happy if we just bring Serge back, you know. Um, but yeah, overall, I mean, it sucks. I think um, Fred, his contract situation hurt the Raptors a little bit because they had to deal with that before doing anything. And by the time they dealt with that, a lot of big names were already off the board. Um, And then I was surprised that the Raptors weren't willing to offer Surge more than 12 million a year. I think Grange reported. Um, People were speculating they would give him like a 20 million one-year contract. Um, Korean was saying that the MLSC wasn't willing to go into the luxury tax for him. So... That's all a little bit weird. Um, but yeah, we we lost Serge and Mark. It sucks. I wrote a little bit on, on Raptors Republic about how like this is kind of a side tangent, but like when it, in the year 2020 where analytics nerds rule NBA discourse, um, nobody talked about any of the like on-court like theatrical stuff that those guys brought to the court. That, they, that we will be missing in Toronto and that now the Los Angeles teams will have gained. Everyone just talks about like the numbers, you know, and they're obsessed with transactions and changes. But it's like, I wrote a little bit just about like Surge, particularly because he was here longer and because he was a showman, you know, 
he brought a lot of entertainment value to Raptors games. You know, he wasn't the most skilled player, but just his dunks, his timely baskets, his blocks, he, he always knew when to, to hype up a crowd, when to actually like make an explanation, put on a bucket. And I appreciated that about him more than anything. But yeah, yeah, that makes sense as far as his contract situation. I thought he was going to get like one year 14, one year 16 so that they could stay under the luxury tax and they could just pay him with bird rights for one year because, you know, who else are they going to give the money to? Even the way that it worked out with Baines, Lennon, Boucher with um, Baines and Boucher having unguaranteed years for their second years of their contracts and Len signing just a one year as well. The way it was structured, the way it went out, they actually did have extra money. DeAndre Bembry getting money as well. But the Raptors, even with Fred Van Vliet, the second year of his contract, getting the highest percentage possible dip that it could possibly have to create as much cap room as possible for next summer. What does next summer mean? I mean, there's a lot of speculation. It could be Giannis Antetokounmpo. It could be any number of free agents. It it could be a lot of things. But the Raptors have created this room for themselves in the future. They've maintained the future somewhat with Baines, with Boucher coming in. But as you said, Serge Ibaka, Marcus All, more so than the analytics, as you pointed out, might indicate, oh, they're going to be missed. There is this chemistry, this cohesion aspect of what they bring to the locker room. Do you think that'll affect the win-loss margins next year, or do you think it'll just affect being a fan and not having Serge Ibaka? Yeah, I think more so from an entertainment perspective will be affected uh i think we'll we'll lose some of that value with mark's passing and and serge's just overall showmanship but in a win-loss percent perspective like you look at what the raptors got from their centers last season mark i think played 20 regular season games uh something like that serge i think played 50 out of the 70 so you didn't actually get more than about 70 games from your from your two centers in the regular season. So in terms of wins, no. I, I really don't think it's going to affect the Raptors' regular season that much in terms of how many games they win. I think they'll still be a top four seed. I think they'll have home court. That's just the Raptors' system, their organization, their competency, their star players, Pascal and Lowry. But if you ask me about the playoffs... I think Serge and Mark, that tandem, whether they play together or separately giving 25 minutes each, like that versatility that they brought to the team was huge. And that, I think, the rap that's where the Raptors to me took a dip this offseason. And that's where they got worse. It's that, you know, like Bam and AD, they proved last offseason, like it's not size that wins. I think that's the misconception a lot of NBA fans have right now. It's it's skill and it's like versatile big men who can play different systems against different opponents, right? So like you can put Bam out there and ask him to do different things within each series or from series to series and he'll do it and same with AD. And now I think the Raptors have a guy like Baines who cannot do that. And I think where you when we had Serge and Mark, we, we had a lot more flexibility and versatility in the front court where we could play different different ways against different opponents. I agree wholeheartedly about the point you make with Bam Adebayo. In the finals, I thought Jimmy Butler was unquestionably the Heat's best player. Up until the finals, I thought that Bam Adebayo actually was the best player on the Heat, and I thought his versatility in matchups, his ability to beat any big man that was in front of him, whether it be Brooke Lopez, whoever... I thought that that was the key to the Heat's run to the finals. But also, a question for you. Do you think that Aaron Baines is enough of an amalgam, this combination of both Serge and Marcus All? Because Aaron Baines is not the passer that Marcus All is, but is a better passer than Serge Ibaka. Aaron Baines can make a high low feed. He can run dribble handoffs. He can do that kind of stuff. He shoots the three point shot at a higher Uh, Well, he's more prolific, let's say. He's not a better shooter by the percentages, but he's more prolific. And he does shore up defensive rebounding. So he does a lot of the things just not all together. Do you think that'll benefit the Raptors? Or like you said earlier, I guess if you're going to stick to your guns, are they going to feel like they're missing something? Or does he combine enough of both? 
Yeah, I mean, to me, I I guess I, I'm separating into two conversations. One is the regular season, and one is the playoffs. But um, like I remember in my group chat with my like friends, we were talking about right after the Raptors lost Surge and then Mark. I said. Like basically, the only way we can save this is if we get Baines, because to me, he was the only big man, big man still on the market by that time that brought enough, like veteran, you know, know how, and a guy who can play at the end of a fourth quarter in a playoff game, and getting so we got Baines, and so that that's huge. I really like Baines as a player, and and like you said, yeah, I agree. He 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 brings a really good mix of what those two guys bring to the floor. Um, and that's why I think the Raptors, in the regular season at least, are going to be fine. Um, but I'll stick by what I said about the playoffs. I think Baines, you know, he'll give us, what, 25 minutes, 25 good minutes in a playoff game. Um, but I think, like, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not necessarily pessimistic about the Raptors. I actually think they have a chance to go far, but I think their best lineups, and we can talk about this if you want, but I think their best lineups are with OG at the five. I agree. That's, I don't know if you saw my tweet that had OG um, photoshopped yeah. onto Bobby Lashley's body, but that's my closing lineup is OG at the five, Pascal at the four. Uh, I guess you have Norm at the three, Fred at the two, Kyle at the one. Yeah, Some of those are interchangeable. Improve, if you can improve Norm, like at the trade deadline, if you can improve that spot... That's ideal to me, um, but, you know, we, I don't know if you want to talk about more. Oh, I mean, sure. That's a question asked by uh, a colleague of ours, Louis Satzman, my guy, my buddy, my pal, Louis Satzman. He asked on Twitter, why is everybody trying to trade Norm? Because Norm represents a lot of the deficiencies on the roster. He does a lot of things that can't be replicated elsewhere. And I said, my response was, I think people are prepping for his assumed exit because his contract has to come off the books, has to, has to, has to, if the Raptors want a max contract this upcoming summer to get that big, sexy free agent. Now, if we're just looking at it this season in a vacuum, in a capsule, who do you improve? Like, who is the guy that Norm gets you? Is it worth it to trade Norm if it's just this season, just to succeed come playoff time? Like, who do you think is the guy you could go get that makes the Raptors tangibly better for a longer playoff run? Yeah, I don't know. It's hard to say because, like, so much changes in an NBA season by the time the trade deadline comes, right? And by then, you know which teams are sellers and which teams are buyers. But I do think that it's worth trading Norm just for an expiring this season, just for a guy who's going to help you this season. Ideally, you could trade Norm and package him for someone on like a rookie scale contract who will give you production for multiple years, right? Um, like Wendell Carter Jr. was like a name brought up a lot this offseason. That would be like Norm and a first round pick for him would be like something I would love. Um, but... Yeah, I, I don't know if I could say, like, who who he gets you. I just think, like, A, I think they're a little small when you have Fred, Kyle, and Norm at, at the 1, 2, 3, obviously. Um, so if you can trade him for a bigger wing, that's ideal. And B, all, all the things you guys brought up on Lewis's post, I agree with in terms of the contract situation with Norm. But... Um, I wrote at the start of last season how Norm was the X factor of the of of last season, right? And it turned out he had a great regular season and helped them win a lot of games. Like in the regular season, I think Norm's contribution was actually downplayed a, a little bit. Like he was insanely timely. Um, but to me, it's just one too many playoffs now where he has kind of been unable to show consistency. And that's really the playoffs is when players are really judged. And, and Norm's just kind of been inconsistent again and again. I know Norm is a really, he's an interesting player in the fan base because you'll get people still to this day in my mentions who will say, oh, he just can't finish. He, he can never finish. But last year he was like 80th percentile finisher at his position. He was legitimately a good finisher. As you said, he was so timely. He made a lot of three-pointers especially. And 
it was like it came to the point where it was like the Raptors need a bucket. You run a pin down for Norm on the weak side. He comes up. He's either going to make the read and pop out for a three or he's going to make the dive and he's going to get to the bucket for a layup. And it was he was that consistent for them in the regular season. They did not have that in the playoffs, as you point out. So it, for a trade, like if you're thinking team building into the future for Wendell Carter Jr., yes, I do that immediately. I think using Norm to go collect on somebody who has, let's say, all-star potential, like Wendell Carter Jr., when they're kind of undervalued in a certain franchise, I think would be a great use of Norm's current upside and current value. But as far as this year, I think it's tough to capture a guy who fits the Raptors better than him, just for like one playoff run. But as you say, you know, we don't exist in a vacuum or a capsule. You know, you have to keep thinking about things going forward. Who would you rather have, um, Norm or um, uh, the guy that Golden State just traded for? The Kelly Oubre. Guy. Yeah. Oh, Wave Poppy. Uh, I'd rather have Norm. I would rather have Norm. I get Oubre has the size. I like Oubre a lot. Actually, I think Oubre was 83rd in my top 100 ranking. I think Norm was 75 or 76. They're close. But Oubre Jr., I think... Well, it's some of it is about Michael Bridges and Ubre Jr. and how Phoenix succeeded without Ubre. And I know eight and zero in the bubble is legendary and also meaningless at the same time. But you know there are things to take away from that. I'm surprised Ubre Jr. All anybody needed to give was a first round pick. That that shocks me a little bit, especially with Golden State assumed to be at least decent with Steph Curry now Ubre Jr. Draymond Green Wiggins James Wiseman in the fold. Uh, rest in peace, Clay Thompson's Achilles. That sucks ass. But I think that I would rather have Norm. I think he is a more consistent shooter. And I think the Raptors, the way they run their offense, are more consistent on shooting. Because if it was about guys who punch gaps and guys who make timely cuts, OG Ananobi would have been factoring in more often, I think. So I think just given the context of the roster, I'd rather have Norm than Ubre Jr. But I mean, hey, they're they're both good, but yeah, it's it's tough to see a guy for this season that they can go get and like package somebody for that doesn't infringe upon future plans. Which, by the way, they structured contracts, they they very much have. As far yeah. as the other two guys, Boucher, Len, let's start with Boucher first. What are your thoughts on Boucher? Because I famously said to Lewis last year that I thought Dewan would figure in to the Raptors last year more than Boucher. I was not high on Boucher. And that's a mistake on my end. But now Boucher has, he's delivered on some of the promise. He's had better footwork, not necessarily improving, you know, linear, but he's had better footwork in the pick and roll. His court mapping, marginally better. He understands how to use his length. And he has that in the hectic Raptors defense, his run outs to contest three point shots, those arms, it's valuable. What do you think about him this year with an extended role? Yeah. I don't want to get William Lude here, but I'm also not really high on Boucher. Um, but we'll see. You know, like him in a bigger role is definitely something I'm looking for, forward to. He gives you something that, that the Raptors, other centers didn't, which is a rim runner, right? He's exceptional, you know, take like his insanely long strides just will get you to the basket. And when he's playing with playmakers like Kyle, he's going to eat. He's going to get points. Um, I have no doubt about that, just like he did last year. He, he put up some numbers. But I guess it's mostly, A, his shot on the offensive end. I can't project how his shot will improve. I'm sure he's been pr- practicing it uh, this offseason. But that's a huge swing skill for sure. Because um, I think the Raptors always want to play five out if, uh, if their offseason season signings were any indication they always want to play five shooters if they can um so boucher if he can be that fifth man then you can go s- small in the sense that you have like kyle fred og siakam and boucher which isn't really that small but that's that's a really interesting lineup for me um but defensively how do you guard guys like i mean i'm not even going to say guys like joel and because That'll never be his role. That'll be like the role of someone like um, Baines, for sure. But but defensively, Boucher has to be able to stick with centers. I think 
um, if he wants if he wants like a, a big role in this team because Siakam and, and OG that's the front court right like that's that's your three four four three depending on how you look at it for most minutes so I think Boucher he he needs to just his IQ is really the biggest thing like I'm sure he's studied Mark's game enough to know that like. You don't necessarily have to be the fastest or the most athletic, but you need to put yourself in the right positions to succeed, and that's just something I don't see him doing enough. Um, he's still new to the game relatively, though, and like he's learning and trying to get better, and, and we'll see. But I can't really say um, how he's going to fare in a larger role this season. Yeah, I think he's, as, as you pointed out, there's something I wrote about in my triumvirate piece, is definitively he's going to find the seam. Like, He's going to work with Kyle Lowry in the pick and roll. He'll get to the bucket. And especially as a change of pace big to kind of a lumbering bowling ball version of Aaron Baines, Chris Boucher will be faster. He'll catch some defenses off guard. There'll have to be some, I guess, they'll have to get, a, and there'll be an adjustment period, let's say. And he'll take, there'll be some big second quarters, I'm sure. And the three point shooting, really tough to project because there is no discernible improvement in the form. He's probably just working with, you know, keeping the same form because he has a high release and he's a tall guy with long arms. So just keep working away at it. He's never eclipsed, I believe, 30, what is it, 32% as a professional. So G League, NBA, hasn't eclipsed 32% from downtown. When he was with Oregon, he shot 34%. So... If he gets really hot for a short season, like I could see it going as high as 37. If he's kind of slumping, you know, it could be around like 28, 29%. Like it's just, there's a big variance there for him to hit, but you you can't see him becoming like a legitimate, completely unabashed five out three point shooter who's just going to like let it rain. Maybe he, maybe he will like in function, he'll do it because he likes to shoot. But as far as like effectiveness, probably not going to come in at over 36%, probably. Yeah. I just I think that's his best pathway to getting big minutes in in Nurse's system because I think Nurse when he sees like guys make defensive mistakes, he's quick to pull a plug and like that's why the Raptors like covet high IQ guys. Um and that's what I see missing a little bit from Boucher's game is is that IQ factor. I, he just makes too many mistakes on that end. But I will say he he provides great entertainment value. Very yeah, he he, he can recover better than any other big on the roster. Like it's it's mm-hmm. not close. If a guy gets a step on him for whatever reason, if he switched out, a guy gets a step. Boucher has that extra amount of time that his body will allow him to get back into the play, his length, his quickness. So it's it doesn't have to be as exact, but there's still that deficit there where he's going to be lacking behind Baines, who Baines is a smart enough defender that Boston and Phoenix both used him as a hedge guy in the pick and roll. He wasn't just strictly dropped. He had the smarts and he had the court mapping to know what angles he allowed that he could hedge. And Boucher... I don't know if he's a hedge guy. He's definitely not a switch guy. And being a drop guy at his length can be valuable. But there's limits to that as well. And if the Raptors want to play drop defense while incorporating their end-to-end rotations that, you know, how do you maximize Pascal Siakam and OG Ananobi then if you're just trying to everybody, you know, go straight up and then you have a big man dropping in the middle? It depends. It it's They have a lot of things to figure out in camp, I would suppose, as yeah. far as DeAndre Bembry and the way that the wing is shaping up, Bembry's added, Paul Watson is still there, as is McCaw, as is OG, of course, a Brissett type of guy. Well, Brissett is on the edge, reportedly. So what do you think about the wing shaping up? Wow. Like, what do you think you about that? You forgot a huge name, Samson. You forgot a huge name in, in Raptors folklore. Stanley Johnson. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I'm not even joking about that, to be honest. I think Stanley Johnson has has a shot of cracking the rotation this year. He's still like relatively young. I think he's 24 or 25. Um, I, I was writing his player review, season review, and now I'm just going to turn it into like a projecting ahead to next season because like I think him and Bembry will be kind of fighting for for those wing minutes and. 
I thought Johnson's end of the season was pretty interesting uh, in the bubble. Like, Nurse put the ball in his hands a lot and was kind of just like, all right, you're the point guard for the bench units. Let's see what you can do. And he's a good playmaker. Bembry is too. Bembry's a really good playmaker. Um, but yeah, Johnson's swing skill is also the three. So if he can shoot the three and bring some of that playmaking, I could see him doing a role similar to the role OG played on offense last year. Just... Uh, spotting up with more playmaking than OG. And, you know, he's a very good uh, one-on-one defender. He makes mistakes on the team level, but, like, he's a good... He's a, He could strap... He There's videos on the YouTube of him strapping up Kawhi, of him strapping up James Harden, you know. Um, but, yeah, the wing... I like Paul Watson. Um, the Raptors have a lot of good players. That's why I think I'm not too worried about the regular season. Um, even with the losses we took, like I'm, I'm, I'm actually really excited to see what Paul Watson will do. I'm excited to see what uh, Malachi Flynn will do as that third guard that I think the Raptors really needed um, to come off the bench. And yeah, they'll have a lot of stuff to figure out early in the season, but they're good at that. Yeah, I did the same thing as what you're currently doing with Stanley Johnson. I did prior to his first year with the Raptors. And the more I dug into his, because I figured, okay, what does a guy do that is immediately unlocked when he comes to the Raptors? I thought, okay, transition. So I looked at him in transition. And his downhill stuff, when there's a defender in front of him, not good. Not good at all, Stanley Johnson. When he's coming from the wing, then he can do some stuff. He's an explosive athlete. As far as his shooting he is gone. I, I believe he's gone. Like his three point attempt rate has been higher than 40%. I believe in his last year with Detroit, it's been high. He's yeah. thrown up shots and he's tried to get, he's tried to get in rhythm. It hasn't happened yet. I'd be surprised if three point shot came around for Stanley, but I would be very happy if it did because he does have a really solid base. There's nothing askew in his jumper. He's just doesn't really shoot the ball very well. So if it comes around, especially just as a set shooter, hey, comes around. That's perfect. And as you said, he is, you know, he's bordering between plus and elite defender, depending on whether you're looking at man-to-man or if you're looking at team defense. And so he's great on that end of the floor. If he can become even just a net neutral, that's, that's a big deal for the Raptors. Paul Watson, I like a lot. I would actually like to see, if possible, I'd like to see Paul Watson get the bulk of possessions at the start of the year as far as if they're giving any ball handling possessions to the grouping of Johnson, Flynn, uh, Watson. I want Watson because he just has that, he's tall and he has that shake. He really has a nice handle. He can get spots on the floor. He's comfortable pulling up. I'd like to see him get some reps just to see what the ceiling is because I think the Raptors, as you said, are going to be fine in the regular season. The floor of this team is pretty much assured. It's Kyle Lowry, Pascal Siakam, Van Fleet, OG Ananobi. They're going to win games, and they have Baines in tow as well. They're going to win games. See what you got on the end of the roster. See who has shot creation skills. Pair him with Baines sometimes so he can get set loose on screens and stuff like that. That would interest me a lot as far as Stanley Johnson and Pat McCaw. If they want to stretch their legs, sure. I just don't see that same wiggle or the same pull-up ability as far as that goes. But it, it is really interesting. I guess... Pascal Siakam is like the flex, right? And OG and an OB is as well. But Pascal and OG, that's the flex positions. The guys who oscillate between front court and wing. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts on those two heading into the year? Man, I'm excited because I don't know what it is about Raptors fans, but they it seems to me that they don't they take Pascal for granted a lot, I would say. Like we have a guy at the start of his prime, who just made all in, second team All NBA, who had a bad bubble. But like, why are you gonna project from like twenty games in a bubble in the middle of a pandemic after not playing for three any like picking up a basketball for that many months? Why are you gonna just assume that he doesn't know how to play basketball? To me, it doesn't make any sense. I get like analyzing guys on the bubble because you know that's their job to play there, but. The reaction to Pascal doesn't make sense, but I'm really excited, man. Like those two are are our future, basically. Um, and I think everyone's been saying this, but OG's definitely primed to take like a much bigger offensive role. 
uh, and play a lot more five if Nurse is willing. Hopefully he's willing. So I think he has some some MIP potential for sure. But I'm excited. Pascal's my favorite player on the roster. I'm excited to just keep watching him grow. I know some people are like, take the ball out of his hands, like put it in like the guard's hands, like let them make plays. But like, I disagree. I think give Pascal all the room to grow as possible in the regular season because it's the regular season. Like it doesn't matter that much and we win games regardless. So I want to see him keep shooting threes, keep running, like playing the pick and roll as a ball handler and just learning to make better reads and just improving. Yeah, I I don't understand the calls to remove the ball from Pascal's hands. I don't have a problem with that. I think if anybody needs the ball less, it would be Fred. And not a whole lot, but Fred Fred has a lot of possessions. And not only that, but he has a lot of assisted possessions. And what I mean by that is he gets a lot of screen help. Pascal, for whatever reason, the Raptors do not give him screen help. He's one of the highest usage ISO players in the whole league last year, like on par with LeBron James. Mm-hmm. What are what are we doing really if Pascal is going ISO the same percentage as LeBron James and posting similar efficiency rates for the record and better than Giannis for the record? This pre-bubble. It doesn't make sense the way that they use Pascal, really. It's just like this toss him the ball and make something happen. There was this idea last year that this was in preparation for... The playoffs, this was, and then in the playoffs, they would have counters. Like we would see the vaunted small, big, or big, small pick and roll with Kyle setting screens for Pascal. If teams wanted to switch, they're in trouble. If teams wanted to hedge, they're in trouble because Kyle can flare out and hit a three, stuff like that. That never came. They kept isoing Pascal. And so with Nick Nurse, who originally came in as like an offensive genius is now like defensive mastermind and the Raptors read and react offense doesn't have a lot going on outside of, you know, Kyle Lowry's occasional genius and great plays from Pascal Siakam and good spot up shooting from OG and Fred Van Vliet. What is this team really doing to help Pascal? Because functionally, it didn't look like there was much going on. So it's not that I want the ball in his hands less. I just want more assisted possessions. Like, why can't Pascal Siakam run the screen and roll? Like, he can. We've seen it happen. It's an efficient play type. And it it just doesn't make sense to me. As far as OG, OG can probably... He can probably steal some of Norm Powell's dribble... Hand, or sorry, not dribble handoffs. Some of Norm Powell's pin-down possessions... There's a couple possessions he can snake away from Fred and Pascal a game. You can look there. I don't think Kyle should be having the ball any less. That seems like a recipe for disaster. But there's places for OG to get shots from. He was one of the lowest usage starters in the league last year and was clearly deserving of a bigger role. So just seeing those guys with more assistance rather than just for whatever reason the Raptors think like it's trial by fire always. I yeah, I disagree with that. I agree with you as far as Pascal goes. Yeah, I don't really understand that approach either. I I, I was in that group too where I was like they're just trying to like make it as hard for him as possible in the regular season and then in the playoffs they'll they'll make it easier and actually run plays. But yeah, I criticize Nurse for that Boston series, you know, like I wrote about it. I think he 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 definitely made some things that he he could have done differently um and i'm with you that fred had the ball too much and i think part of that to to not blame nurse was that the raptors were tired by game seven uh kyle was tired by the end of it so that's maybe why he didn't have the ball for that final possession but like to me when i replay that possession in my head it's like why don't we just have like Pascal coming downhill, Kyle setting a back screen. Like they did this a couple times in the regular season. So, so the like Pascal's defender is like trailing and hits Kyle, right? And then he has room to go to the basket. Like that's, that's to me more of a recipe for success than like Fred, you know, getting a mismatch and then trying to take a big man off the dribble. Yeah, I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me either. We'll see with the Raptors new coaching um assistance if if anything changes um but definitely makes sense to put pascal on the pick and roll more 
have a have a little guy screen for him, have a big guy screen for him. It doesn't really matter. Yeah, uh, Chris Finch, who came from New Orleans, they used to run a blade set that would get Julius Randle going downhill. And if you can get Julius Randle as limited as he is to the bucket, then you can run a blade set inverted on the other side of the floor and you can get Pascal Siakam to the bucket. And Pascal shot 77% on drives this year. It was number one in the NBA. So just like give him some assistance, Mm. let him get downhill. As far as the Boston series as well, it, one thing, and I'll say this, this would be irresponsible if I did have sources within the Raptors organization. I don't. So this is speculation. This is not a report or anything like that. Nick Nurse writes in his book about OG Ananobi complaining that Fred won't give him the ball to carry up the court because Nick Nurse said he wanted OG Ananobi to get some extra possessions, ball handling, and they want OG Ananobi bring the ball up court. That's what they say. It's like a mandate. They want that to happen. Fred doesn't do it. Fred doesn't give OG the ball. And OG walks by Nick Nurse in the hotel room and says, he's still doing it. Like, and didn't even say anything else. Just mentions that, keeps walking on. So there's the aspect, right, where we're sitting here and we're saying, ideally, the Raptors should play like this. Look at all their strengths. Play to those. On the floor, a guy like Fred Van Vliet might be like, I'm not giving OG the ball because I should have the ball. And that is tough to factor in because you don't want to be, you know, armchair psychologist and saying Fred is kind of selfish. But sometimes, and this is irresponsible of me to say, Fred comes off as a selfish player on the court. He does come off as that type of guy. So how much of his possessions are getting axed next year, where those are getting divvied up, if they will at all. That's very intriguing to me. So I want to take that opportunity. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. This is more of like a philosophical question, I guess. But don't you think that's Nurse's fault? Um, like, yes and no, because he's probably having those conversations. And Fred Van Vliet doesn't have to listen. That's what I mean. I was assuming that Fred Van Vliet does not have to listen. Like, Fred Van Vliet might be on the floor... And he's good enough that Nick Nurse can't legibly just take him off. You know what I mean? Like, he's out there to guard Kemba. Like, he's guarding Kemba. You got to keep him on him as great as OG was in spurts, like on the switches. But if Fred Fred wants to go solo on something, if Fred wants to pick and roll possession, like, who knows? And another thing with Pascal is that, and same with, like, Giannis Antetokounmpo, as far as how we view him, like, should Giannis be running the pick and roll in... Uh, Milwaukee is like maybe Giannis doesn't want to run the pick and roll maybe he doesn't want to be the ball handler maybe he doesn't want to be the guy on the dive either like players don't have to do what they're most efficient at and Pascal may be at the top of the arc calling for Serge to screen maybe Serge doesn't want to screen maybe that's why like this year Aaron Baines being such a willing screener a guy who sprints Mm -hmm. all around the floor to screen like there's it's not lackadaisical like he gets to his spot he bumps the guy first, like he'll get there. So that's why I thought when I wrote my Baines piece that Baines is a big man who provides the Raptors shot creators with a lot of opportunity to try and be shot creators this year. And then you can kind of see where their ceiling is at. I thought that was a really great decision by the Raptors roster. But yeah, I don't, the players can do whatever they want. Like the, it's, they're responding to stimuli too. Like it's a read and react game. It's not like they can just go to the line, like in football, call out the play yeah. and like that's the route. It's it's tough. No, yeah, that's a good point. Watching Baines, it's clear how much his teammates like playing with him. So I'm excited for the Raptors to maybe be a little bit more unorthodox with him because he's clearly willing to do whatever. Um, and I also love how he like when his teammates will put up a shot, he'll sprint for the offensive rebound, even if he's like out outside the arc. And uh, and that rebounding is huge. Like I, I think I don't know if we talk about it enough, but the Raptors they lacked size or rebounding. Probably would be a better term because they had some size, but they were one of the like middling teams, like 15th in the league in rebounding last season, and it hurt them in the playoffs, even against a team that isn't that big in Boston. Um, so Baines will be helpful there in terms of like what you said with Van Vliet, I agree with you. You, you can't make Van Vliet do anything, but I think it goes back further to like nurse giving Van Vliet maybe a little too big of a leash where he got so confident and, and like, it's hard to say because part of that confidence helped him become such a good player for the Raptors. But part of that confidence also helped him 
take that last shot, you know? Like, I think they gave him a little bit too big of a leash. And now he's on this big contract. I don't really see that leash getting cut away very much, but it wouldn't hurt to, especially in the regular season. Yeah, that is... I think that's the most interesting conversation for Fred this year. And, well, maybe it shouldn't be because, you know, it's not really fair to speculate, but here we are. And, like, you know, there are reasons to speculate, but also who who has the intel other besides, like, an interpretation of how he plays on the floor, of what his motivations are to do a thing. But as far as objectively without incorporating what he thinks of it, I think he has the ball too much. I'd like to see his possessions go to OG. I'd like to see it work like that. And the thing about Fred is that he's not a dominant on-ball threat. He is, and Jacob Mack, uh, he said this on Twitter. He writes at Raptors HQ. He said that the benefit of Van Vliet is that like he's an all-NBA defender on defense, and he's like short Clay Thompson on offense. Like He's a tremendous spot-up yeah. shooter, one yeah. of the best in the league. He relocates rapidly, which he does, and he's at his best off ball. Let Fred cause havoc off ball, then get some middling return possessions of pick and roll when Kyle's out of the game. See what happens with that. See if he can improve, which he, you know, there have been modest improvements to his game, but it's, Fred is, I don't think there's much left to go. I know some people really love Fred. They like see him as like just everything for the Raptors, and he's good, but. I think we're nearing the the top end of his production, and I'd like yeah. to see the Raptors put him in a more advantageous position for the Raptors rather than a more advantageous position for Fred's next contract, which is, I think, a little bit of what happened last year. Right. So let's talk guards. Malachi Flynn, Kyle Lowry. I think we can leave the Fred Van Vliet stuff. We've talked about it. So Kyle, Malachi. I'll, I'll just get this out of the way. Terrence Davis, his hearing is December 11th. The Raptors fearing some sort of sanction or some sort of payback. Well, not payback, some sort of penalty from the NBA Players Association if they cut Terrence Davis before December 11th when his hearing is. That seems to be the sentiment, is that the Raptors are inactionable until the NBA finishes its own investigation and the hearing happens. Depending on how the hearing goes, there's a very wild side of the hearing could go a certain way that the Raptors would almost certainly cut him. There's a more tempered version of it where the Raptors might try and keep him on the roster. I'm not super sure. As I said earlier, no sources inside the organization, but that is the situation with Terrence Davis. So currently I'm assuming that he probably isn't on the team going forward. I could be wrong, but the guard rotation, as you said, looks like it's Fred. Kyle and Malachi is that third guy. And then they'll start looking for guys on the wing to start taking possessions. What do you think about Malachi and Kyle for this year? Yeah, I'm, I'm excited about Malachi. I know it's such a Homer thing to do to be like, Oh, the Raptors found another gem in the draft. Like we probably would have done it regardless. And, um, I know some of the draft people I was listening to ahead of the draft didn't, they had guys like Desmond Bain above Malachi Flynn who is still on the board. But when you watch him, you're like, oh, yeah, this is the most Raptors player ever. Like, of course they took this guy. Like, um, it's exciting. And I think, like, not to beat on the Fred thing anymore, but it is an interesting pick in the sense of, like, it basically, like, there's no way around saying that Malachi is going to take the ball out of Fred's hands a bit, right? Like, they drafted him knowing full well that that's the situation. So maybe we're over, like, anxious about something that the Raptors are already trying to deal with, you know? Um, Because it does feel like that pick was like, all right, we need another ball handler. Fred's getting a little too much on-ball plays, so let's give it to this guy and see what he can do. But yeah, he's exciting just because, like, he can shoot. He can do everything. He's a really good pick-and-roll player. He's very crafty. So I think he'll be an entertaining player to watch. Like, he's very... He's small, but he figures out ways to score around big guys at the basket. And he's just fun to watch. He also has that like gene in him that he's just willing to take that last shot um, at the end of the game. And yeah, I'm excited to watch him. And within, I believe, his conference, Defensive Player of the Year. 
He was right. really a guy like he'll get into your asshole if you're if you're another if you're an opposing guard like he'll he's gonna be super annoying. His size he might not project as like a truly like an absolute stopper of a guard. Like if De'Aaron Fox decides to like absolutely turn on his athleticism, he's mm-hmm. six five, extremely imposing and tough to get past. Like Eric Bledsoe, super jacked if he wants to lock down. Malachi Flynn is less physically imposing. That might affect his defense to some degree, but at the very least, he's going to be a good defender in the NBA. That's a, that's an important thing. As you yeah. said, he's an exceptional pick and roll player. He was by rights a top five pick and roll player in the country in college. There there are very few that could even say they're in the conversation with him. He's one of the best mid range shooters in college last year, and I just think he's. He's a smart player. Like you said, there's a lot of craftiness. There's a lot of guile to the way he goes through his possessions, kind of goes through his reads and what he's doing. So getting a guy who can kind of snake into the middle of the lane and beat a dropping big with a mid-range jumper, that's nice. As far as you saying maybe he's coming in to take the ball out of Fred's hands, I don't know if that's the play. I wonder if it's because Malachi will definitively, and this this could be, you know, absolutely irresponsible on my end but maybe malachi is a guy they draft they know the ball is good in his hands it, as much as it can be from a draftee they know he's on a good contract over the next few years and they know that kyle probably isn't here next year because they're gonna have a new max free agent i don't know and i hate talking about the possibility of kyle being gone but that seems like a vague possibility but then also they could just be looking at this year saying we want Fred off ball a little bit more. Mal guy's going to come in and run some pick and rolls with Baines and Boucher. We'll see how it goes. But at the very least, he's a good player. I'm excited that they picked him, even though I did want Bain. I wanted Desmond Bain. I like him a lot. I'll just say like briefly, at, at the time, the pick didn't make that much sense because it's like this is a guard heavy roster. Why are you picking a guard? But you look at free agency and like, you can get a veteran big man. Big men have to be veterans. Like, if you're trying to compete, you can't go put a rookie big man out there and expect him to close games for you in the playoffs, right? It's just too demanding of a position. But that's why, like, Xavier Dillman, like, made sense. But then when you really think about it, it's like, is Xavier Dillman going to help us compete this season? And the answer is probably no. Um, I think Malachi will help us compete this season more. So that, that actually makes sense to me in terms of, like, the it's we just spent nine million dollars on on Len and, and Baines, right? That's like that's great. Like that's a great use of your of your money because to me, you either spend big on a guy like Bam or AD, or you spend marginally on your big man position. So that's why that made sense. And as as for Kyle, I don't know if it's like a given that he's gone. I think there's at least like a twenty percent chance Kyle retires as a Raptor and just like. They get if they get a max free agent, I think there's a chance Kyle comes back on like a, you know, a bargain deal. It w- it would have to be a bargain deal because his cap hold is ginormous. I think it's thirty plus million. So they'd have to they won't have his bird rights. So he Kyle would have to sign for like mid level stuff, mm-hmm. like a piece of the mid level exception. So that's interesting. We'll we'll see what happens, you know, down the road, obviously. I like the point you make about big men having to be veterans, and especially, it's a really great point, is the one where you say, you go big or you go small with a big man. The idea of getting stuck in the middle and paying Jeremy Grant like 20 million a year, that kills your roster. Absolutely, it does. So the Raptors paying, you know, Ibaka these past couple of years has been doable because they have bird rights and they can do that. And they're obviously, he played a big role. The Raptors won a championship, but outright signing like a guy to 15 to 25 million, that's trouble. And so, as Mm -hmm. you say, like the Raptors, if they want to compete this year, they weren't going to sign a big because they couldn't afford to do it. Like not at that level. You're not going to draft a guy, even though Xavier Tillman looks great. You have to try and get like bargain bin guys and you have to get a guard who will probably come in and contribute right away, which is, you know, what happened with Malachi Flynn, ideally. Mm-hmm. Is there is there any other interesting factoids you want to walk through as far as what the Raptors did? Yeah, I just think like what I said um, assumes that the Raptors will compete. So I guess I'm curious to hear like what your thoughts because like I think 
they got a little bit worse, but I think they went into this offseason and the signings they made and the draft picks they made um, suggested that they think they have a chance of competing for a title this year. Yeah, that's a really interesting question because this year they got worse if Fred, Pascal, and OG are static. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, it's not fair to say that OG has a Pascal-level jump because OG is already starting at a place where he's an all-NBA defender. I genuinely believe that he could be like a top-five defensive player of the year, vote-getter, like he should be in the conversation. Mm -hmm. He's that damn good, as is Pascal. So having that, he, he can't make a Pascal jump. And the usage rate, it's just the possessions aren't there either. But if OG takes turns from a guy who can hit spot up three pointers in the pressure cooker of the playoffs at 40% when he's being pressured, when there's a guy running out at him, not just on that incredible game winning three, but in other games against Boston, hitting three pointers down the stretch game six, especially like having a pick and pop and hitting a three right from the top of the arc. OG was hitting those. If he goes from a guy who can confidently hit threes, which he can, that's definitive to a guy who can pump fake, take a dribble, and do something with it going downhill, that radically changes how teams have to play him and how they have to operate as far as the weak side defense they have if he's on the weak side. So there's a lot of space for OG to improve markedly. That really affects how teams play primary defense on Kyle, Van Vliet, and Pascal. That being said, that's not a super easy progression. OG is at the spot where a lot of players plateau. A lot of players plateau. Mm -hmm. So it's tough to project. Pascal can get better because, of course, he can. Because he's an incredible... Pascal is one of the players who is so unique that he's second team all NBA, but you can plainly see the holes in his game. And they they aren't the type of holes that guys can never fill. He's already Mm -hmm. filling the holes that guys never make the jump to. So that's, I think, is interesting with Pascal. So he can definitively get better, 100%. Definitively, he can definitely get better. Um, But as far as the big man, the big man rotation is worse. Definitely it is. But there's still room for the roster to grow where they can be around the same level as team that they were last year. And I think everybody's assuming that Kyle's the same guy because Kyle's just always been the same guy. But, you know, if father time is undefeated, something Kyle could drop off a cliff or he could just drop slightly. All these things affect the team. But as far as what I think, they they could be a fringe title contender, like a puncher's chance because they have young talent that could improve in OG and in Pascal. Do I think they're a team that I would be like, oh yeah, they're making it past the second round? Probably not. Do I think they make it past the first round of the playoffs and are a top four seat? Yes, I do. Yeah, no, I'm I'm with you. I think I think it could be good the roster shakeup and the fresh faces, especially for Nurse, because I think like I love Nurse as a coach. I don't want to say anything bad about him, but he he got, I would say, if I was to critique him, too comfortable in the roles that he had for his players. Like he liked Mark Gasol starting and closing games and nothing Marcus all did was going to change that you know what I mean like that was frustrating for me because even when Mark was not playing well in the bubble he was still closing games meanwhile you had OG who proved in game six against the Celtics they're like all right this is working you know like this is working OG at the five why didn't we go back to that in game seven for longer stretches that frustrated me so I think the roster shakeup it just being different um, getting Baines in, getting Flynn in, it'll force Nurse to kind of reconfigure like what the rules are, and that could be a good thing because it'll give guys like OG a chance to prove themselves. Yeah, that is really interesting. Is that because there are really there are no stakes to what we decide as analysts or as fans? Is that we see it work with OG? We're like that worked. There's no way it doesn't. It works, but he has to make the call. And the thing is, like, net rating darling lineups that exist on every team that get underplayed. Larry Nance at the three in Cleveland, like, we need Larry Nance at the three. Like, that that lineup kills people. That type of stuff. Coaches can look at the net rating 
But all they have to see is like the first two minutes of that lineup playing is like a couple shots flip flop one or the other. And all of a sudden you look like an absolute dumbass. I, I agree with you, though. I, I do think that Nurse is not as mad scientist as some people make him out to be. The matching Gasol to Embiid minutes on the playoff run, like to the chip, was not given. It, it came at the very end of the series when he finally said, okay, we're matching every minute, and then did in game seven, I think, what, like 45 minutes to 45 minutes, something like that. So he is a little bit slow to come around, I think. Slower than people would have you believe because they yeah. they want you to think like he has these chemicals and he's just pouring them all these like, it's like Yzma and Kronk in the lab or something like that. But yeah, it's yeah. it's tough. It's tough yeah, out they, there. But they I have agree. room to grow offensively, I would say. But defensively, I think they'll take a little step back. I'd be I'd be very surprised to see them stay at the same level. But that's apt. I think that's apt. Yes, I I do not see a route to a better defense this year. I think that's a good way of pointing it. And offensively. There is room for Baines to, because he is the amalgam of Ibaka and Gasol, to at times eclipse offensive output. But as far as defensively, he's not going to get there because he doesn't have the help side pop of Ibaka and he doesn't have the rotational smarts of Gasol, I would say. Mm-hmm. All right, Oren. Uh, it's, it's just about an hour. Feels like a Perfect. good chat that we've had. How do you, how do you feel about it? Uh, I enjoyed it. I, I enjoy talking to you. I enjoy talking Raptors. I'm disgustingly excited for the season to start. Life is so boring these days that <laughs> even though I'm literally writing uh, for The Guardian right now about how they probably shouldn't do this with all the COVID stuff, you know, like the NBA. I love how like the ESPN people are just like ignoring. I, not just ESPN, honestly, like everyone who covers the league is just ignoring this. It's like, we just spent so much money on a bubble. Now you think after like Thanksgiving when things are spiking worse than they've literally ever been that you can just go about traveling the country and people aren't going to get COVID. Like this is ridiculous, but at the same time as a fan, I'm very excited. So I have very conflicting feelings. I don't know. No, that that makes sense because the NBA currently has the the sheen on it because they didn't have a single case. but. They're not doing a bubble this time. They're doing something radically different. As soon as that first case happens in the NBA, everyone's going to be like, oh, what the hell? This makes no sense at all. Why are we doing this? So I'm I'm intrigued to see if there's blowback on it. I'm intrigued to see what happens with it. But as far as they have that sheen because they didn't have a single case. And as soon as the first one comes, that sheen is gone. The NBA is no longer the star child as soon as that happens. So... It's, it'll I be do interesting. think it's unfortunate. It is unfortunate, though, because, like, coronavirus is one of those things that, like, yes, they are healthy athletes, but, like, there's long-term effects to this thing, right? Like, we we still don't know all of them, but we, we know that, like, 25% of, like, patients still have, like, irregular, like, lung scans, like, two months later. And, like, brain damage is, like, very common in survivors. So... It's unfortunate that the NBA is kind of just going about this like, yes, some people are going to get COVID. That sucks, but we're going to work around it as best we can because like this is a serious, you know, virus, but they are a corporation. You know, that's what we have to remember as fans. They've never been about the players. They've always been about their money. And even though we would like to see it run differently, um, that's just not the case. Agreed. Yeah. Well, the floor is yours before we get out here, Oren. Is there anything you want to plug or send the people to before we finish up? Um, just follow me on the Twitter sphere at Oren Weisfeld. And uh, hope you have, hope you all have a good winter and get through this. It's going to be tough um, for sure, especially in the cold weather like Toronto uh, with COVID and everything. But I wish you all the best. What a what a nice and gentle note to sound off on. For me, that's it. I'm out of here. Uh, make sure you follow Oren on Twitter at Oren Weisfeld. If you can't find it for whatever reason, uh, just go to Raptors of Public. I will link to it there. But as far as uh, us here, listener, you, myself, Oren, 
we're finished. We're out of here. And uh, whether you're getting into this in the morning or at night, have a blessed day and goodbye. 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 Goodbye.